to get my stilling square jaw. Are you sort of like, like that? I'll show you. Like that. <laughs> Is that your mic? Brilliant.
Okay. Yes, please. Okay, yes, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, I will make sure nobody else uses it. We will use the right hand side microphone. So do you want Sia then to say yes. we are raised voices? Um, or, or will I will say? come back to you and say the choir you just heard was raised voices. Okay. If that's okay. Do okay. you have a little thing that you want me to read out about you? Um, or I've got a little um, um, recruitment card. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, how do I um, pronounce um, Stefania surname? Maurice. Maurice, yeah? Maurice. Think of Mao and Maurice. Can I request you to take your place?
Okay, yes, please. Thank you. Sorry. I don't mean to rush you. No, it's no, just okay. she's going to play the last song. So. Thank you. For the song, and then you will take your seats, and then they will start. I will, I will, from the sides, I will introduce you as uh, raised voices. Do you want to take the two steps, or do you want only one side? Okay. 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 Just wrap everyone up. Hi. Are you with the choir? Please do come up.
Diana Stevenson on the piano. Thank you, Diana. And as you can imagine, that piece of music, Bella Ciao, was in honor of Stefania Maurizi, who is hidden behind the chor choral singers up there. Before we start, I just wanted to welcome our choir. Can you hear me? Mike's not on, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? No? Sorry, we're just going to check that everything's on. Thank you. <clears throat> Testing now. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Uh, firstly, I just want to repeat my thanks to Diana Stevenson, who was here playing the piano, and that rendition of Bella Ciao was in honor of our special guest today from Italy, uh, journalist and author Stefania Maurizi, who is hidden behind the choristers. Uh, but sh sh you will hear Stefania's voice loud and clear in a little while. I want to thank all of you who are here. I will do my introductions in a second. But before I go into the introductions, another little burst of music from a wonderful group of people. They're called Race Voices, and they sing for peace, justice, and the environment. They're against militarism and capitalism, racism and sexism, and they sing at meetings, demonstrations, and other events, including ours. So very warm welcome to Raised Voices. Hello. Our first song, can you hear me? Good. Our first song is called In Contempt. It was written by Aaron Kramer and Betty Sanders in 1950, at that time the height of the Cold War. The Un-American Activities Committee of the House of Representatives Just was conducting... Can you, can you hear? Okay. Can you bring it closer? was conducting a witch hunt. Is that okay? Um, um, sorry, can I hold it as close as possible to you and then, yeah. Was conducting a witch hunt to root out suspected communists. Anyone whose beliefs or activities aroused suspicion was subpoenaed. If they refused to appear, and name the names of others, they were blacklisted and jailed. Some pleaded the Fifth Amendment, the right to free speech, but this did not prevent them from being assumed guilty and losing their jobs. The song is one of defiance, of contempt for the oppressors. In October last year, we at Rose Voices sang it to commemorate the death of Chandler Davis at 96, who defied the committee, was jailed for six months and unable to work ever again in the US. And also of Chen Yuzhen, who had just completed a year in detention in China, unable to see her two young children. Both of these were family members of ours. We thought it particularly relevant to sing in contempt in the campaign for justice for Julian Assange.
Free the Truth was created about uh, close to four years ago as a space for ordinary people to understand what was going on in relation to whistleblowing, human rights and press freedom in Britain and around the world. We started with a wonderful event that Craig joined us at here. Um, in 2019, not long after Julian Assange was dragged out of the embassy and jailed in Belmarsh Prison. My co-host, Professor Ian Munro, and I saw this as taking our academic work into a, a more real-world space to allow us to debate different points of view with with candor, with respect, and with integrity. I'm so grateful to see you all here today. Thank you so much. I know we have people in the audience from Norway, Germany, from various other parts of the world who have traveled over specifically to be with us here. We are also joined today, thanks to the wonderful camera people you see here and those restreaming online by people in the US, and in other parts of the world, far across the seas, who, who care about what we care about, which is justice, peace, and equality. And to have justice, peace, and equality, we need truth. Truth is the fundamental for that. And it is that truth that we are seeking to defend today in defending the right of Julian Assange to serve as a journalist and a publisher and tell the truth about US war crimes. War crimes like the murders, the rape, the torture, the destruction of civilization that we've seen, as well as the war on terror, the impact of the war on terror that saw what you see around the room today documented by those who suffered at Guantanamo. So around the room you will see art from Guantanamo and the various prints. These were drawn by the people who were kept prisoner without trial or charge. Mansoor Adeifi, whose work is on stage, went in as a teenager. He was there for 14 years. And his painting is the story of life and death separated by a thin line called hope. And his piece, he says, talks about the fact that the US cannot keep people dead in Guantanamo or essentially living but dead in Guantanamo 
while continuing to, you know, we, we, we in Europe, we in the US cannot keep people dead while continuing to cherish our lives. Because our lives are incomplete and not alive unless those around us are alive and happy too. And it is in this spirit that I welcome you and some of our very esteemed guests in the audience, including the wonderful Selma James, who is here from the long-standing campaign for justice for women and for racial justice and indeed for societal justice. So I'm very grateful to her and to Lisa, who was here at our first event speaking. And to all of you in the audience, many of whom I know for your work and your contributions to society. So I'm going to stop talking now and let you hear our wonderful speakers. And I'm going to try and resume my place without tripping over something first. So, uh, just to remind you what's available in the room in addition to the art, there are little mementos at the back, little souvenirs of Mansoor Adeifu's painting, and there is a lovely message from Mansoor that I will play in a little while, uh, telling you a little bit about the art. Um, there are also signed copies of Stefania Maurice's new book, At the Door, with Jeannie and her colleagues, Jeannie's holding it up. If you would like a copy, please pick one up. Copies are also available of Professor Niels Meltzer's, the former UN Rapporteur's book, on the case of Julian Assange. Again, available at the door. If you would like to make a small donation, if possible, at the end, towards the cost of hosting a bigger Guantanamo art event with the original art in May. Please, would you either make a donation in the bucket at the back, or if you'd like to make a larger donation or pay by card, because it will be quite expensive to bring the art for the first time outside of the US to Britain, um, please let me know and I will give you details. I'd like to start with our first speaker, Stefania Maurici. Stefania has done some wonderful work uncovering what really goes on behind the, behind the scenes in the corridors of power. She has done what good investigative journalists do. And it's indeed quite surprising and in a way disappointing that it has taken an Italian journalist to follow through on the corruption and the nepotism that we see in Britain today. I'd like to start by asking Stefania to say a little bit about her book and then inviting Jonathan Cook, who is to our right, um, to say a few words as well about his analysis of the book. And Craig will then come in with his wide-ranging experience of the case and experience of being a whistleblower who brought to light torture in Uzbekistan and suffered for it. So um, Craig is here both as a journalist, one who we regard very highly, given his well-read blog, and also as a journalist. So we have three wonderful journalists on, on the stage, and I invite Stefania first to please kick us off. So <clears throat> thank you, Deepa, and thanks to all. It's a great honor to be here, and I feel honored that we started with a song which I really love, Bella Ciao, <laughs> and, uh, which is a song about our fight against fascism, being Italy the country which invented fascism. And I think this case really goes to the heart of what a totalitarian state is. And the first victim of totalitarianism, the, first, the very first uh, um, 
the very first features, the very first thing that may, should make people horrified about uh, the direction, yeah, the direction taken by, okay, is that okay? The direction taken by society is the destruction of freedom of the press. That's how Mussolini started. One of the very first things he did was to establish who was a journalist, who was a legitimate journalist, and who was not. Because that's how you control who publish, what get published. So when I, rea I saw the US government saying in its indictment, in its press conference for um, when the charges against Julian Assange were, were basically unsealed, uh, Julian Assange is not a journalist, is not a legitimate journalist. It reminded me the dark days when the fascist regime was in charge of deciding who is a journalist and who is not a journalist. And it reminded me those dark days. Obviously, we are not in, in a fascist society. Hold this closer to you. No. Okay. Obviously, we are not in a fascist society, otherwise we wouldn't be here discussing the Julian Assange WikiLeaks case. But what is happening in this case should, should scare everyone. And I'm the first to be really scared about what I have seen, what I have witnessed in this case. I have been there from the very beginning, very, very beginning, 2009, when very few knew about WikiLeaks. Uh, very, they hadn't published their bombshells like collateral murder, which made, them, which made them famous around the world. And it all started because uh, one of my sources, in, one of my journalistic sources, had stopped talking to me. She was convinced she was under illegal interception. And of course, there is no way to know whether you are under illegal interception. It must be, it could be paranoia, it could be <laughs> a real paranoia, or it could be real. There's no way to know whether you are under illegal interception. So that source, that journalistic source, at that time I was working, I was already working for the Italian leading news magazine, L'Espresso, a progressive news magazine, heavily focused on um, corruption, mafia, um, exposing uh, uh, threat, fascist, fascist threats. And I was working for L'Espresso, and that source that never ever revealed me anything. I still, after 15 years, I don't know what she knew. Basically changed my journalism forever. Usually our journalistic sources change our journalism because of what they tell us, what they reveal to us. But in that, in that case, my source changed my journalism forever for what she didn't tell me. She, didn't want to talk to me, she didn't want to meet me, she was convinced we were uh, under control, we were uh, followed, we were spied, so she didn't want to meet me. And it was at that point, precisely at that point, it was 2008, one year before I, con I was contacted by WikiLeaks. It was at that point that I realized that I needed better source protection because what we have, what we all use, telephones, emails, are very easily to penetrate, especially if you have money, if you have good technologies. So in these days, very, very easy to penetrate these <laughs> technologies. They are no longer suitable for the 21st century. And even if they are using no newsroom around the world, the, most of the journalists use telephones, most use emails, so I, I realized I needed better source protection. And for me, it was natural to look at cryptography because I'm a, I'm a mathematician. Before journalism, I, 
I got a degree in maths, so I knew there was this thing called cryptography, but I knew very little. I just had, uh, you know, uh, theoretical knowledge. I didn't have any uh, practical skin in using cryptography. You use cryptography. Uh, as I said uh, all the time, you use cryptography even if you don't realize it, that you are using it. You use uh, WhatsApp. You use, uh, you know, systems for um, making uh, home banking. You don't go to your bank physically. You don't go to your hospital to download your uh, medical records. You do it from the internet, or someone do it for you from the internet. And they can do that, because cryptography allows you to do this kind of operation without all others seeing your medical records, all others accessing all bank records. That's cryptography. And you know, at that time, there was nothing. There was no WhatsApp. There was no, was no signal. There was nothing. There was just uh, cryptography was really unfriendly. Very few knew that cryptography existed at all. Just the military, computer scientists, mathematicians, spies, diplomats, which use cryptography to protect their communication. And there was only one org media organization in the world using cryptography. And that media organization was not the New York Times, it was not the Washington Post, it was not the Guardian. That media organization was WikiLeaks. And one of, when one of my sources in the field of cryptography told me, you should have a look on that bunch of lunatics. It was joking, but he appreciated the work of WikiLeaks. I didn't know WikiLeaks. I didn't know Julian Assange. And that source put WikiLeaks on my radar screen. I established the first contact with WikiLeaks. I was deeply impressed by what they were doing. They were able to obtain documents which no one was able to obtain. Why? And the explanation was cryptography. In the darkness of state secrecy, many, many, there were many who disagree with the extremely brutal uh, techniques and uh, um, tactics used during the war on terror, torture, brutal torture, uh, extrajudicial killing. In the darkness of secrecy, there were many, both on the left and on the right, because <laughs> it, even if you are a right-wing person, it doesn't mean you are a torturer or you stand by torture, of course. Willing to send these documents anonymously, protected by cryptography. And this is why they received this documentation. And one of the very first documents which deeply impressed me was the Guantanamo Manual. Guantanamo Manual about the military task force operating Guantanamo, which no other organization, civil rights, human rights organization, had been able to obtain. Not even the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, which had tried over and over, and they had good lawyers, and they had good uh, litigation <laughs> capability, and yet they had been unable to obtain it. But WikiLeaks obtained it, WikiLeaks published it, and not only that. What also deeply impressed me was the fact that they had obtained it. And when the Pentagon had told them, please remove it, because you are not authorized to publish it, they said no. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was so impressed, because I have been a journalist for the last 21 years, 16 in the field of journalism, uh, investigative journalism. And believe me, I have known very, very, very few people willing to say no to the Pentagon. So that courage deeply impressed me, deeply impressed me. And uh, since then, the first time I worked as a media partner with them was 2009, when they called me in the middle of the night because they had an important file and they want some help to verify it and to, check, to understand the local context. And I understood they were working as a media organization, because this is what media organizations do. They receive documents, 
they establish whether they are true, and they establish if they are in the public interest or whether it is not gossip, it's not silly things. And if it's true and in the public interest, they publish. So since 2009, I work on all their documents, all their secret documents, especially those US secret documents for which Julian Assange risks 175 years. I think this case is absolutely outrageous. I'm here, I have published the very same documents for the last decade. I was never arrested. I was never put in prison. He has paid for all of us. It's absolutely, it's absolutely crucial that we win this case and we free Julian Assange. Because if the government can win this case, if they can put in prison a journalist for revealing war crimes, our society will go direct, straightly to full authoritarian. So this case goes beyond Julian Assange. Of course, of course goes, <laughs> his life hangs in balance. So <laughs> the first thing is to <laughs> save his life. But this case is about the kind of society in which we want to live. Do we want to live in a society in which you can expose war crimes, you can expose torture? This is what a democracy is. In a totalitarian state, you cannot expose state criminality at the highest level. They kill you. They send you killers. They send you in a prison, in a dungeon for life. In a democracy, it must be possible. So this is why I take every opportunity, and I want to thank Deepa and you all for being here, to uh, tell you that we have few months, few months to save him. And if he leaves this country, if he leaves Europe, he's gone. If he extradited to the US, he will be his death. And with him, it will be the death of free, the free press and the death of your right to know what the government is doing, the darkness of secrecy, with your money as a taxpayer and in your name. Thank you. Our next speaker is someone who someone once described to me as an heir to Chomsky because of his ability to look at the big picture and, and extract from smaller pieces of information what we really need to know and what we really need to discuss as a society. Jonathan is an author, a very courageous journalist, and someone who doesn't shy from the truth but does so in a very measured and meticulous way, which is why he has the reputation he has. Jonathan, can I invite you to speak? But before you do, may I ask you to double check that everybody can hear you, because I'm not sure how sure. that... Uh, can you hear me all, all of you? Yeah? Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Deepa. That's very kind. And thank you so much to Stefania for writing a book that an important work on... Uh, giving us the chronology of what happened to uh, WikiLeaks and, and Julian Assange. Um, I thoroughly recommend it. But what I want to do uh, in my contribution is to focus on the title of tonight and look at how WikiLeaks challenged the model of democratic media, um, how it presented a, a challenge to how we think democratic media operates. Um, and I want to um, quote uh, at length um, a comment that Julian Assange made back in 2011 um, when he was talking about what he called perceived moral institutions, such as the liberal media. And this is what he said. What drives a paper like The Guardian or The New York Times is not their inner moral values. It is simply that they have a market. In the UK, there is a market called educated liberals. Educated liberals want to buy a newspaper like The Guardian, and therefore an institution arises to fulfill that market. What is in the newspaper is not a reflection of the values of the people in that institution, it is a reflection of the market demand. Now, Assange presumably came to that insight, having just spent 
uh, a year working with those two newspapers on the Afghan and Iraq war logs. I think one of the mistakes we typically make when we think about the so-called mainstream media is imagining that its outlets evolve in some kind of gradual bottom-up process. We're encouraged to assume that there's at least an element of voluntary association in how media institutions form. At its simplest, we imagine journalists with a liberal or left-wing outlook coalescing, gravitating towards other journalists with a similar outlook, and together they produce a left-wing or liberal newspaper. And I think we sometimes assume the same thing about the right-wing too. All of this <coughs> requires, <coughs> sorry, requires ignoring the elephant in the room, billionaire owners. Even if we think about the owners, and we're usually discouraged to do so, we tend to suppose that their role is to provide funding for these free exercises in journalistic collaboration. For that reason, we infer that the media represents society. It offers a marketplace of thought and expression in which ideas and opinions align with the vast majority of the population. In short, the media reflects a spectrum of acceptable ideas rather than defining and imposing that spectrum. Of course, this idea is ludicrous if we pause to think about it. The media consists of outlets owned by and serving the interests of billionaires and large corporations, or in the case of the BBC, a broadcasting corporation entirely reliant on state largesse. Furthermore, almost all media corporations need advertising revenue from other large corporations to avoid hemorrhaging money. There's nothing bottom-up about this process. It's entirely top-down. Journalists operate within this, these ideological parameters. They're strictly laid down by their outlet's owners. The media doesn't reflect society. It reflects the interests of a small elite and the national security state that promotes and protects the elite's interests. Those parameters are wide enough to allow some disagreement, just enough to make Western societies look democratic, <laughs> but the parameters are narrow enough to restrict reporting, analysis, and commentary so that dangerous ideas, dangerous to corporate, corporate state power, almost never get a look in. Put bluntly, media, media pluralism is the spectrum of allowable thought <laughs> among the power elite. If this doesn't seem obvious, it might help to think of media outlets like any other large corporation. Let's take an example, a supermarket chain. Supermarkets are large warehouse-like venues stocking a wide range of goods, a range similar to the other ones, but <laughs> usually there's a, a slight variation in pricing and branding. Despite this essential similarity, each supermarket markets itself as radically different from its rivals. It's easy to fall for this pitch, and most of us do, to the extent that we end up identifying with a particular supermarket over another one, believing it shares our values or it embodies our ideals or it aspires to things that we hold dear. We all know there's a difference between a Waitrose and a Tesco, but we might struggle to identify exactly what that difference amounts to. It's hard to know beyond the competing marketing strategies and the targeting of different shopping audiences. All supermarkets share a core capitalist ideology. All are pathologically driven by the need to generate profits. <laughs> All try to fuel rapacious consumerism among their customers. All create excessive demand and waste. All externalize their costs onto the wider society. Now let's bring it back to the media. They're there to do essentially the same thing, each of them. They can only monetize their similarity by presenting marketing it as a difference. They brand themselves differently, not because they are different, but because to be effective, if not always profitable, they must reach and capture different demographics. Supermarkets do it through different emphases, maybe promoting Coca-Cola over wine, or accentuating their green credentials and their promotion of animal welfare over value for money. It's no different with the media. Outlets brand themselves as liberal or conservative on the side of the middle classes or on the side of the unskilled worker, as challenging the powerful or being respectful of the powerful. 
the key task of a supermarket is to create loyalty from a section of the shopping public to stop those customers straying to other supermarkets. Similarly, a media outlet reinforces a supposed set of shared values among a specific demographic to stop readers straying to other publications, looking elsewhere for their news, their commentary, and their analysis. The goal of the media is not unearthing the truth. It's not about monitoring the centers of power. It's about capturing readers. It's so far as a media outlet does monitor power, or it does speak difficult truths, it does so because that's its brand. That's what its audience has come to expect of it. So how does that relate to this topic today? Well, not least, it helps clarify something that baffles me, at least, and probably some of you as well. Why haven't journalists risen up to support Julian Assange in their droves, especially once Sweden dropped the longest preliminary investigation in its history, and it became clear that Assange's persecution was, as he always warned, paving the way to his extradition to the US for exposing its war crimes? The truth is that were The Guardian and The New York Times to have clamored for his freedom, had they investigated the glaring holes in the Swedish case, as Nils Meltzer has done, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, were they screaming about the dangers of allowing the US to redefine journalism's core task, not as treason, or if they had, um, he's screaming about how the Espionage Act was being used to redefine journalism as treason. Had they used their substantial muscle and resources to pursue a freedom of information request as Stefani has done on her own dime? Were they pointing out the endless legal abuses taking place in Assange's treatment in the UK? Had they reported rather than ignored the facts that came to light in the extradition hearings in London? In short, had they kept Julian Assange's persecution in the spotlight, he'd be free by now. Yeah, yeah. The efforts by the various... <laughs> the efforts by the various states involved to gradually disappear him over the past decade would have become futile. They would have been self-sabotaging. At some levels, journalists understand this which is precisely why they try to persuade themselves and you that he's not a proper journalist. <laughs> That's why they tell themselves they don't need to show solidarity with him and why some of them even amplify the state's demonization campaign against him. By ignoring Julian Assange, by othering him, they can avoid thinking about the differences between what he has done and what they do. Journalists can avoid examining their own role as captured servants of corporate power. Assange faces 175 years in a maximum security prison, not for espionage, but for publishing journalism. Journalism doesn't require some special professional qualification as brain surgery and conveyancing does. It doesn't depend on precise, abstruse knowledge of human physiology or legal procedure. At its best, journalism is simply gathering and publishing information that serves the public interest. Public, that's you and me. It doesn't require a diploma, it doesn't require a big building or a wealthy owner. Whisper it, any of us can do journalism. And when we do it, journalistic protections ought to apply. Assange excelled at journalism like no one before him because he devised a new model of forcing governments to become more transparent and public servants more honest, which is precisely why the elite who wield secret power want him and that model destroyed. If the liberal media was really organized from the bottom up rather than the top down, journalists would be incensed and terrified by states torturing one of their own. They'd be genuinely afraid that they might be targeted next. Because it's the practice of pure journalism that is under attack, not a single journalist. But how is that, how, how, that isn't how corporate journalists see it. And truth be told, their abandonment of Julian Assange, the lack of solidarity they've shown, is explicable. Journalists aren't being entirely irrational. The corporate media, especially its liberal outlets and their journalist servants, understand that Assange's media revolution, embodied by the WikiLeaks venture, 
is far more of a threat to them than the national security state. Put crudely, the liberal media views WikiLeaks as a threat, much as the high street does Amazon. Though, of course, that analogy unfairly strips out WikiLeaks' far more noble purpose and methods than Amazon's. WikiLeaks offers a new kind of platform for democratic journalism, in which secret power, along with its inherent corruptions and crimes, becomes much harder to wield. And as a result, corporate journalists have had to face some difficult home truths that they'd avoided until WikiLeaks' appearance. First, the media revolution threatens to undermine the role and privileges of the corporate journalist. Readers no longer have to depend on these well-paid arbiters of truth. For the first time, readers have direct access to original sources, to the unmediated documents. Readers no longer have to be passive consumers of news. They can inform themselves. Not only can they cut out the middleman, the corporate media, but they can assess whether that middleman has been playing it straight with them. That's very bad news for an individual corporate journalist. At best, it strips them of any aura of authority and prestige. And at worst, it ensures that a profession already held in low esteem is considered even less trustworthy. And it's also very bad news for the media owners, those billionaires. They no longer control the news agenda. They no longer serve as institutional gatekeepers. They no longer define the limits of acceptable ideas and opinion. Second, WikiLeaks, the WikiLeaks revolution sheds an unflattering light on the traditional model of journalism. It shows it to be inherently dependent on, and therefore complicit in, secret power. The lifeblood of the WikiLeaks model is the whistleblower, who risks everything to get public interest information that the powerful want concealed, because it reveals corruption, abuse, and lawbreaking. Think Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden. The lifeblood of corporate journalism, by contrast, is access. Corporate journalists make an implicit transaction. The insider delivers snippets of information to the journalist that may or not, may not be true, and that invariably serve the interests of unseen forces in the corridors of power. For both sides, the relationship of access depends on not antagonizing power by exposing its deep secrets. The insider is only useful to the journalist so long as he or she has access to power, which means that the insider is rarely going to offer up information that truly threatens power. If they did, they'd soon be out of a job, and they'd no longer be near power or useful to the journalist. But to be considered useful, the, journal, the insider needs to offer the reporter information that appears to be revelatory, that holds out the promise for the journalist of career, success, and prizes. Both sides are playing a role in a game of charades that serves the adjoint interests of the corporate media and the political elite. At best, access offers insights for journalists into the power plays between the rival elite groups with conflicting agendas between the more liberal elements of the establishment and the more hawkish elements. The public interest is invariably served only in the most marginal sense. We get a partial idea of the divisions within an administration or a bureaucracy, but very rarely the full extent of what's going on. For a brief period, the liberal components of the corporate media swapped out their historic access to join WikiLeaks in its transparency revolution. But they quickly understood that the dangers of the path they were embarking on, as the quote we began with from Assange makes clear. It would be a huge mistake to assume that the corporate media, yeah. the corporate media feels threatened by WikiLeaks simply because the organization has made a much better fist of holding power to account than the corporate media. This isn't about envy, it's about fear. Journalists ultimately serve the interests of media owners and advertisers. These corporations are the concealed power running our society. The pillars upholding this system of elite power, those disguising and protecting it, are the media and the security services, the mind and the muscle. The media corporations are there to protect corporate power using psychological and emotional manipulation, just as the security services are there to protecting using invasive surveillance and physical coercion. 
WikiLeaks disrupts this cozy relationship from both ends. It threatens to end the role of, corp of the corporate media in mediating official information, instead offering the public direct, direct access to official secrets. And in so doing, it dares to expose the tradecraft of the security services as they go about their law-breaking and abuses, and thereby imposes unwelcome sc scrutiny and restraint on them. In threatening to bring democratic accountability to the media and the security services, and exposing their long-standing collusion, WikiLeaks opens a window on how sham our democracies truly are. The shared desire of the security services and the corporate media is to disappear Assange in the hope that his revolutionary model of journalism is abandoned and forgotten for good. It won't be. The technology is not going away, and we must keep reminding the world that Assange, what of what Assange accomplished and the terrible price that he's paying for his achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Our next speaker is someone who has wore, worn many hats, whether it is as rector at the University of Dundee, or as whistleblower, or as the star in a BBC4 play, or indeed as a journalist revealing the inside workings of power in various situations, as an independence campaigner for Scotland, and as somebody who has always spoken up for the public, in the public interest. Our next speaker is author, blogger, journalist, Craig Murray. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here again and to uh, see so many people I know here again and also happily to see some people I don't know. Uh, it, it's uh, great to have some new faces along. Um, I should start by saying I think I'm the only person in the United Kingdom who officially is not a journalist, uh, according to a decision by the High Court of Scotland, um, which, is, uh, which is extraordinary as well, because I'm also the only person in the United Kingdom who is officially according to the High Court of England, not an anti-Semite after another court case I was involved in. So um, uh, how I get myself um, into these uh, legal cases, which are always the law having a go at me and, and me defending myself rather than me initiating anything, I, I, I'm really not quite sure why I'm seen as such a threat to the state when all I do is publish um, on a blog which they feel has to be delegitimized, um, uh, harassed by continual attack and, uh, and deprioritized by suppression of uh, social media. Um, it's, it's extraordinary that, that somebody like me, uh, who has really done nothing except write true accounts, for example, of what happens at Julian Assange's trial, write, write the detail of what happens in the courtroom itself, um, all I've ever tried to do is publish aspects of the truth, not, not <laughs> in the spectacular mass fashion that, that WikiLeaks managed it, but uh, plodding away at, in the same cause. Uh, yet that nowadays is deemed uh, such a threat uh, to the state that they have to suppress you and even imprison you. And I, I think that says something deeply, deeply worrying. And I, I think we ought to think, here am I telling you I am officially uh, not a journalist. Uh, and let's look at what people are doing who officially are journalists. Uh, how many people have seen the Daily Telegraph today? That is the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Um, I'll, I'll send this into the audience so you can pass it round in, in a moment. Dominated by a huge photo of two men in Ghislaine Maxwell's bath, uh, and the headline is, the photo that clears Duke over bath sex. And the purpose of the photograph is to convince everybody uh, that Prince Andrew could not have molested a sex trafficked minor in that bath because the bath 
is too small. Now, not only does that tell us something uh, very interesting about the sex lives of Daily Telegraph journalists, <laughs> it's an astonishing exercise in poor taste. But you've got a convicted sex trafficker in the United States, and the photo the article tells us is posed by two of her friends with the object of attempting to show uh, that a member of the royal family uh, could not have taken part in the sex trafficking which he paid over $12 million to get out of. Who, who finds that at all reasonable? And who finds it reasonable that one of the adults poses in the bath, presumably as a joke, because there can be no other reason for it, with a mask with the face of the sex trafficked young woman on it. That's just disgusting. And that is one of the United Kingdom's oldest and most respected broadsheets and the newspaper which is the closest to our current government at Westminster. That's what the establishment think journalism is. That is disgusting, that is immoral. You don't go to prison for that. You go to prison for publishing the truth about war crimes. We live in a society where respect for true journalism is non-existent and the real journalists are punished and the most disgusting sycophants and smearers are those who get on in the journalistic profession. If someone could grab this, if you could pass it around the audience just so people could uh, look and see what I was talking about while I, uh, while I continue. Um, it's wonderful to see the artwork from Guantanamo here today, the copies of it, and um, I very much hope that we do manage to raise the funds to get the original artwork over here, but, because you know, artwork from Guantanamo is a real triumph of the, of the human spirit over terrible oppression and reminds us of the evil uh, that we're fighting against, the evil that collected people in Afghanistan and shipped them off to Guantanamo deliberately by design to put them beyond law so they could be systematically tortured. Think of that. The whole purpose was to put people where they might be tortured. And the dreadful tortures people suffered uh, in Guantanamo have been, I, I've heard, I've sat beside people while they uh, enumerate the tortures they were subjected to. And it reminds us of what WikiLeaks helped reveal and the kind of behavior the state is attempting to cover up and make sure it can do in secret in future by its persecution of Julian. It also reminds me of the war on terror period and the collusion of the media in the terrible waves of Islamophobia in the oppression of entirely innocent Muslim people in this country and elsewhere in the attacks on civil liberties that were carried out under that excuse. I remember the front page stories on things like the ricin plot and on the Easter bombing in Manchester um, where seven people were arrested and it was the headline TV news on every channel uh, and it was the front page in every newspaper that the police had foiled a bomb plot at Easter in Manchester by descending on this house and that they had removed materials, including materials that could be moved in bomb making. Uh, and several months later, um, when the poor people who had been imprisoned throughout that period were eventually released without charge, uh, it turned out that the materials that could be used in bomb making was a bag of granulated sugar in the kitchen, uh, none of which the, the, the arrests having been all over 
the front pages. The release, I think, got um, one very small paragraph on page seven of The Guardian, and that was about it. The fact it was all simply untrue um, uh, was never published. And that was a deliberate ramping up of fear and the stoking of Islamophobia by the security services amplified by the media. And we've seen extraordinary further lies by the media. The famous uh, story of Manafort calling on Assange uh, in the embassy, uh, which was utterly untrue, simply never, ever happened, and for which, with no shame at all, uh, the Guardian refuses still to this day uh, to recant, despite it obviously being false. Now, I add into that, and, that, and I think um, Jonathan brilliantly uh, outlined the reasons we have this media and the use of the media for exerting social control. And I add into that the corruption of the legal system that we have seen in Julian's case. And corruption is the only possible word. Funnily enough, I was first alerted to it um, before uh, the American extradition case, when the Swedish extradition process was still in train, um, by, of course, the extraordinary gap between uh, what was happening and the lack of any actual serious evidence from the investigation, but also when there was a judgment by uh, the House of Lords, by Lord Phillips, uh, was the lead judge, uh, in that extradition case, where the decision that Julian could be held for extradition um, turned on the question of what was a judicial authority, because an extradition request had to come from a judicial authority. And in the Swedish case, it didn't. It didn't come from a court or a judge. It merely came from a prosecutor, a politically motivated prosecutor, after other prosecutors had dropped the case. And a prosecutor is plainly not a judicial authority. Um, and uh, this went all the way to the House of Lords. And in the House of Lords, they ruled, and this is absolutely true, I'm not making this up, but while a prosecutor is not a judicial authority in English, the extradition uh, arrangement, European extradition arrangement, uh, was in French and English, and both languages were equally valid. And if you looked at the French version of the treaty, it said autorité judiciaire. And while judicial authority in English does not encompass prosecution, uh, prosecutors, in French, judicial authority does encompass prosecutors. This is absolutely astonishing. I mean, I was a, a, a diplomat for more than two decades. I was involved in negotiating and drafting treaties. Um, it has never, ever been the case that in signing a treaty, the United Kingdom government has preferred the French language version to the English language version before. Uh, that, 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 that is a simple impossibility. And the idea that when they signed the treaty, the UK authorities were, were, were signing in French, not in English, uh, is, is, is plainly a, an utter nonsense. Plus, it's simply untrue. The phrases in English and French mean exactly the same thing. It doesn't mean something different in French. This incredible bit of judicial sophistry, this, this simple lie, and this extraordinary precedent setting that in future we're going to prefer the foreign language version of treaties, all of that was done as a ruse to keep Julian in custody. And all of it was complete and utter obvious bollocks to anybody who was closely followed what was going on. And that was when I first realized, and that was about 2011, 2012, that was when I first realized something is very, very wrong here. Then, of course, I started uh, attending uh, the, the hearings uh, after uh, the United States extradition proceedings came in, and they were even more astonishing. You know, the, the ruling that 
you can be extradited under an extradition treaty, but the uh, Article 2.4 of that extradition treaty that forbids political extradition does not have effect because the treaty does not have effect in English law, but still you're being extradited under it, um, what was a piece of judicial gymnastics that was almost impossible to understand. The fact that the uh, prosecution, uh, the United States government, had all Julian's legal papers after having them stolen from the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, that, that was absolutely astonishing. It went on and on as an absolute circus. And we are at a stage where something needs to change. We need a massive uprising in public opinion because we have a controlled media, we have a controlled judiciary, we have increasing restrictions on freedom of speech where it's almost impossible to find any platform, not even a meeting hall, in which you can voice opposition to the war in Ukraine, for example. We are living in a society which has crept further and further towards fascism and is continuing to do so. And it gets worse year after year after year to the point when we really are almost there. Getting Julian out of jail has to be the start of a fundamental change in society, in the way society is heading. But until we manage to wake up more of society and to wake up the so-called liberal left into what they are going along with and what they are allowing to happen in our country, that won't happen. It's been a hard campaign. I'm actually more optimistic for Julian than I have been for a long, long time. There have been many signs of particularly senior politicians, his own government in Australia, and of the media finally waking up and smelling the coffee and realize what's going on. I think we are making progress. We get a far better hearing in public and far better public reception. And I'm sure you will find that too when campaigning than we did four or five years ago. I do believe that things are going our way we have to redouble the fight to make them continue to go our way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. And uh, as the legal observer in the, in the hearings, I have been astonished at the kind of rubbish that we get, including being told that I could take in pen and paper, but I'm not allowed to write. I mean, it is, it is just astonishing. So, but but I'm, I'm so glad that Craig talked about, brought everything together and explained how our campaign for Julian is not just about him, it's also a campaign for justice for the men whose art you see around the room. And our next speaker, um, Ian Overton, who, who, who's CTC there, unfortunately due to being ill, uh, really wanted to be here, but he's, he's not been able to travel. He will come to our next event. But we have in, in his place, uh, and in fact in his own place actually, um, a wonderful young man who spent 14 years at Guantanamo, without trial or charge, and this is his voice. I hope you can hear him. He, is, he doesn't yet have his passport in his hand, although he's finally been granted one. An innocent man finally been granted a passport. Uh, but hopefully he will have it soon, and he will hopefully be with us for the exhibition in the summer to tell you a little bit more about his art and the art from his colleagues. I also wanted to highlight our friends from CAGE who are here today. Um, we are grateful for their solidarity. This is 21 years since Guantanamo was opened. 35 men are still there. Um, some, many of them cleared for release. And it is astonishing that many people don't even know that Guantanamo is still open. So here is Mansoor Adaifi's voice. I'm going to test the sound uh, with our live stream audience. So first I, I'll check. Uh, if that works, and then you can hear him. I think also you should invite Mohammed to London in case. 
oops, sorry, that's not seeming to um, to play. I will I will translate Mansu's message. Mansu's message is one of solidarity, and um, and a great deal of I think forgiveness, and a sense of horror at what continues to happen at Guantanamo. He he and his fellow colleagues, many of whom are struggling financially, uh, would be grateful for your solidarity over time. There is a. I will share on the Eventbrite site and also with those who are interested, details of the art from Guantanamo if anybody wishes to buy pieces from any of the artists. But um, unless Eileen Chubb is here, uh, if she is in the audience, I, I can't see Eileen, is she? Great. Fantastic. Eileen, um, are you... Are you ready to, is, is Jeremy here as well? Or do we? Uh, is Jeremy here? Okay, so he's running late, okay, thank you. So we, if you wouldn't mind taking a seat up front, as soon as Jeremy arrives, we can do this. We will now move to the question and answers, which will be moderated by my colleague, Professor Ian Munro from Newcastle and myself. Unfortunately, this mic is no longer working, so we're going to stick with one mic, so we might just have to uh, share it between us. I hope you can still hear us. So we'd now like to start with questions from the audience. If you would please raise your hands. And if anybody who is watching on the live stream is watching through uh, things like YouTube, where your question is being handed over, I believe some colleagues in the audience are going to bring your questions through as well. So if you're on the live stream and you, want, you have any questions of any of the speakers, please let us know. Uh, questions from the audience, please. Yes, Eileen. Eileen Chubb is uh, here with us, and Eileen will, of course, introduce herself later, but she's here on behalf of a number of whistleblowers. So. Where, just a second, we'll, we'll get the microphone over to Eileen, just a second. Um, Gordon, would you mind? Thank you so much. No, we'll grab it. Can you hear me? I just wanted to comment on what Craig said about the kind of stories that are making the media. Recently um, here, we've had a man who's responsible for tens of thousands of elderly people dying in care homes splattered over the front pages for weeks on end of newspapers in the UK. And it's, it's an absolute shameful situation that tens of thousands of families who are grieving see somebody being celebrated as a celebrity in newspapers every day. So I totally agree. And I think that, you know, real journalism is precious and we need to demand and, and buy only, you know, publications that tell us the truth. Current times. 
Um, but I wanted to know a little bit more about the struggle that you've had um, getting these freedom of information requests. I know they're ongoing. And where you feel the, maybe why and how um, you're being frustrated in your efforts to get some kind of transparency going. Um, and maybe, I mean, raise a little controversial issue here, but I mean, they had, some of us are wondering how involved was Keir Starmer at the time of the CPS? I mean, he was at the beginning of this. Um, hey. is, are, are there fingerprints? Any, uh, is it possible to see how? I mean, the story, official story is he didn't know anything about it, but, but given that the, the, these were huge issues of uh, transatlantic uh, interest. All, all three of them. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll take all three of them. Um, well, obviously, th th this was th these issues um, that you're, you're trying to get shed some light on are of huge significance and were at the time, and the correspondence that was going on um, had international repercussions. I find it that the idea that the head of the CPS knew nothing about what was going on just simply incredible. I just wondered in addition to the other question I asked you, whether, whether you've seen anything to indicate that Keir Starmer was involved in making those decisions. So, <clears throat> thank you for this question. So, in the book I have reconstructed 13 years of investigative work in this case. So it has been put in together in a way that is narrative and anyone can read because otherwise, if, if you cannot read the book, you don't read it. You read the book because it is a pleasure to read it. And uh, the book is based not just on 13 years of investigative work, but on eight years, it has become eight years, <laughs> of fighting in UK tribunals, US courts, uh, Australian court, a tribunal, Swedish court, to get the full documentation on Julian Assange. Why I'm so obsessed? Why a journalist dedicates so much time and it's so expensive? Initially, I paid myself. When I reached 6,000 euros, I could not afford anymore. And I said I had to find to, a way to pay the legal fees. In the US, the legal fees have reached 100,000 of dollars in two years. Fortunately, the US lawyers are working completely pro bono, otherwise I would have been unable. Why this work? This work because in 2015, after Julian has spent five years basically confined, initially under house arrest, then in the embassy without not even a, an hour outdoors, and I was, I was basically witnessing how his health started collapsing, collapsing, and I, uh, every time I visited him, this is, was a very visible process, his health collapsing. In 2015, I realized that no journalist had tried to get the, the, the document about this case. How can you win a case if you don't know the facts? You cannot. And an Italian prosecutor, our Italian prosecutor can be very good, very good, and it is not, uh, it is not uh, coincidence that basically we are the only country in the world which nailed the CIA agents which kidnap a person in Milan. We were the only to uh, identify them and to get a final sentence, to charge them and to get the final sentence because of our prosecutors and their independence. So an Italian prosecutor told me, why this case is paralyzed? This is, there is nothing normal about this case. And I said, because the Swedish prosecutors don't want to go to London to question Julian Assange and to decide whether to charge him for rape if they have enough evidence or to drop the charges. And he said, this is not normal. It shouldn't be like this. The prosecutor should go there to question him immediately and to decide whether to drop or charge him, drop the case and charge him. And uh, he said that this is not normal. We Italian prosecutors traveled through Brazil to question very dangerous mafia people. 
and they cannot fly from Stockholm to London to question him, you must discover why they don't want to go there. Of course, I'm an Italian journalist. I have no sources inside the Swedish prosecution. So the only option I had was to use the freedom of information. I filed this freedom of information request in Sweden in August 2015, and what I obtained <laughs> was incredible. Basically, the Swedish authorities provided evidence that it was the Crown Prosecution Service at that time headed by Sir Keith Starmer who told the Swedish prosecutor, don't come here to question him. And by doing so, they basically advised the Swedish prosecutor against the only legal strategy which could have brought to a quick solution of the case, questioning Julian in London and decided how to go ahead. So I got this documentation and it was clear that the crucial decision on the Julian Assange case were taken between 2010-2013 when Keir Starmer was heading the Crown Prosecution Service as director of the prosecution. However, there is not a single email documented that, that he instructed the Crown Prosecution uh, lawyers to take this decision about Julian Assange. However, we cannot say who took this decision. We know the name of the lawyer, Mr. Porclos, but we don't know whether he received any instruction from the top of the, of the Crown Prosecution Service headed by Sir Keir Starman. The only way to know is to obtain the full correspondence the problem is that the Crown Prosecution Service destroyed, destroyed the, the correspondence about the case, why it was still ongoing and highly controversial. And again, I ask our prosecutors, we have all sorts of judicial scandal, legal scandal in Italy, and I ask uh, very experienced prosecutors, is it normal? Do, do we have any example of this of destruction of documents as the Crown Prosecution Service did? And the prosecutor said, no, this is not, not normal at all. We not even has had, ever had a, a scandal like this. So these documents have been destroyed. And I have discovered this in 2017, November 2017. A month after, I went to the embassy to discuss this with Julian Assange, December 2017. <laughs> I discovered two years later what happened while we were talking. Someone secretly accessed all my devices, unscrewed my phone, extracted the SIM. We were spied secretly. Fortunately, they took pictures, so we have evidence that this really happened. Since 2017, when I discovered this destruction of crucial documents, I have been fighting in, uh, the Crown Prosecution, against the Crown Prosecution Court to obtain information about who destroyed the documents, on whose instruction, how, and they refused to provide explanation. Yesterday we had a new hearing at, uh, here in London about this documentation. And uh, basically, I'm still fighting to get this documentation. And soon, no, new important revelation will come out, thanks to this litigation. And we re I really hope to get any information about the role of the Crown Prosecution Service, any, any <laughs> alleged involvement of Keir Starmer, because I try to ask, I try to contact his person, I try to email, I got no reply, and I'm trying to get this documentation at all cost, at all cost, because these documents are dynamite, and that's why four governments are denying me access to this documentation. If it was normal documentation, they would have released it. They are not revealing these documents because these documents contain evidence of serious, serious mishandling, serious corruption in the case. Thank you.
Thank you, Stefania. Um, we will take the three people who are speaking here, uh, waiting here for, to ask their questions. And then we have a contribution from Norway from John Jones. John, if you will be ready. And finally, hopefully by then, Jeremy Corbyn will have arrived to provide a, an award uh, for Julian, which uh, Jeremy is going to uh, share with us. So could I invite somebody to please pass the microphone? Which, this one. Okay, thank you. Could I request you all to maybe, even if I, of course, comments are welcome, but if you keep the comments really brief and focus on the questions, because we, we're, I think we have about 20 minutes more time. Could I also make a specific announcement to those watching on the live stream? Please stay on the live stream after the speakers have finished because um, our kind streamers are going to take you around to see the art because you cannot be moved. So I see Jeremy has arrived, thank you. And uh, when we take the questions, then we will have a contribution from John Jones and then we will have Jeremy present the award. Okay. Um, Sorry to ask a do you agree type question, but I'll, I'll keep it short. It's to do with the language that we're using. Do you agree we should stop using the language of alienation that, that belongs to the enemy? Because Chelsea Manning just did what any human being is supposed to do. When you become aware of a crime being committed, you are supposed to tell everybody. And Julian Assange did what any normal publisher should do, tell everybody. But we use the term whistleblower, which is a minority term and a slanted term. The only thing abnormal about any of this is the horrendous intimidation that stops people performing a normal, absolutely normal, public duty and second just the, we should also stop using the term leaks because it suggests that a vessel needs repairing whereas any vessel that contains and hides the stinking substance of crime should be smashed good evening um, I've got a quick question for Jonathan. Recently I met some young journalists and um, very ambitious, beautiful kids. They, and I said to them, if you join a major organization and it starts doing the things that it's done to Julian, what would you do? What advice would you give them in that situation? Well, I'd just like to congratulate you on this meeting. It's the most amazing meeting I've ever been to with three of the most cogent and compelling speeches I've ever heard. And I've wondered all my life, I've always suspected there was a massive conspiracy against democracy and the people. And I always wondered whether I'd face the sort of question that people faced in the 20s and 30s in Italy, especially, and in Germany, Spain, and across Europe. And I think we are now facing that sort of question. And I think you're incredibly brave, along with uh, Julian Assange and the other people who support him, in putting your heads above the parapet. But my question really would be, where are, where's the next generation? Uh, look around. I mean, I, with all due respect, I don't see anybody under 50 or 40 here. I mean, all the people. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, there's one. All right. Well, with one exception, where are they? It's going to be their world that they're going to live in, and God help them if we lose this battle. Thank you very much. I think there were a few who responded to your query, but I will, I will now request the speakers to both respond to the three queries that were raised and also make their concluding comments. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it back. Well, let me address the question that was, was addressed to me. Um, 
what advice would I give to young journalists who are starting out and want to achieve the kind of transparent society that WikiLeaks was and is still trying to, to achieve for us? Um, the, the issue here isn't really what advice we can give to young journalists, it's what kind of support are we going to give? Because the journalists are operating in a society which can choose, can want to be a transparent society or, or not to be one. There are lots of platforms now for young journalists, more than, when I was a young journalist, you worked your way up the ladder. You started on a local provincial newspaper, you got your exams done, and then you hoped you could get your break in London. And the whole thing was controlled. You were selected. Some of you may have read Noam Chomsky and Edmund Herman's book, Manufacturing Consent. There was a filtering system. And you, each step of the way, you had to convince somebody that you deserved to stay there or to get promoted. And if you weren't a team player, if you didn't abide by the, the rules, if you didn't fit in, um, you weren't going to survive there for very long. And if you couldn't sustain a position in a newspaper, you were, you were doomed as a journalist. You could maybe publish your own little newsletter and put it out somewhere and hope a few people would read it. We're in a totally different world now, where you can create your own readerships. You have, we have platforms like Substack, where you, you can send out to potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of readers. Uh, we have social media, where you can develop your own uh, followings. Um, and we have a world where people can share in information almost instantly. So there's the, the platforms, and obviously Julian Assange and WikiLeaks were at the very forefront of developing those platforms, uh, to make our societies much more transparent. The, the, the problem here is how, how, where is the support for those kinds of ventures? Where's the support for Julian Assange? Where's the support for WikiLeaks? If we allow our society to become uh, to, to wield secret power, to keep power um, veiled from us, then, then young journalists ha ha won't have that kind of support. This is why it's so important that we stand up and make a noise about what's going on to Julian, because if we don't, other journalists will get the signal that they're in danger. Should they try and follow his path, should they try and echo what he's tried to do, uh, it will be too dangerous. So the, the the responsibility isn't on those journalists, really. It's on us as a society to start to prioritize uh, greater transparency, to uphold uh, the kind of journalism, support the kind of journalism uh, that is prepared to take the risk. And when people get um, um, isolated, when they're, when they're attacked, um, in cases like Julian and, and Craig here, when they, they come up against the, the law, um, that we make a noise about it. We shout. We scream. And journalists also need to be doing that, as I said in my, my talk. Um, so that's, we can't have a transparent society. We can't expect journalists to break ranks and say things against power um, if there isn't a wide support for that to happen. If people are just going to allow, keep their heads down and keep quiet, then no, no journalist is going to do it. So I, I, the message isn't really for, for the journalists, it's for us. We've got to support that kind of journalism. We've got to... To, to rally behind people when they're being victimized and persecuted and show that we care and that it's important to us. Um, so it, it's a lesson for all of us to, to start making a noise, as much noise as we can think. That's, that's the lesson. Yes, I, uh, I definitely agree. There's, there is hope. And you know, you, and I, I would like to, also to say to journalists, fight, fight the fight because it's worth. I mean, I had to leave my newspaper and I had to leave my, the major newspaper La Repubblica, the Italian Daily Repubblica, but, and I had very little hope of finding another job as a journalist, but I did, I did. And I saw my income collapsing, which is uh, not a good thing, but I would do it again to do my job. Absolutely would do it again. And compared to what Julian has suffered, my troubles are really nothing, really nothing. And in fact, in my book, I didn't even address these troubles. 
First of all, because I don't want to be at the center of the troubles, <laughs> considering what he has experienced, but because I think, uh, as I said, compared to what Julian Assange has experienced, I have experienced nothing. I, I have experienced intimidation, some intimidation, yes, but not death threat, for example. And uh, I, I had been advised back in 2011, after the big revelation on the cables, Afghan war logs, Iraq war logs, cables, uh, Guantanamo documents. Well, why you risk your reputation for them? Uh, you got your scoops from them, drop them, because it will close many doors to you. And it was true, it did close many doors. <laughs> professionally, but absolutely was worth. So to a, uh, to a young journalist, I would say, do it because it is definitely worth, absolutely. And I just want to reply to the question on the young people. Yes, I noticed there are many, we need the young people. I think many old people have seen the darkness and they see the dark, the dark days coming again with the return of authoritarianism, with the destruction of free press. So they are the first to be alarmed. But I noticed that when I, when I explained to the young people what this case is about, they immediately under, understand what is at stake. So I'm not pessimistic, uh, I would say. Thank you, Stefania. Craig, final words? I'm quite old to make that. Um, thank you. I've, yeah, in reply to the questions, I've, the first question about you know, not allowing the state and the corporate media to frame the language uh, and, and to put us on the defensive. I think that's a very, a very good point. It was occurring to me, Julian is of course now charged under the Espionage Act. I haven't yet heard the BBC refer to him as a spy, but maybe that's coming. That's, uh, but um, you're right, we, we should be careful and we, and we should. Exactly, I mean, Chelsea Manning's a hero. Uh, and, and a hero who blew the whistle on crime. And, uh, We, we, we should be entirely positive on that. Um, on the involvement of young people, um, I think, uh, you know, the forms of social interaction uh, are changing. Uh, none of us die in the same society we, we were born into uh, because society changes as it goes along. And I think um, in the UK, it is increasingly unlikely uh, to get uh, younger people out to this kind of public meeting. Um, interestingly, I. I, I did a tour of, um, of Germany with Niels here uh, before Christmas for a month, uh, and there the audiences were definitely younger than you get in the UK. But when we um, did the hands around Parliament uh, demonstration, where we went, you know, across both bridges and both sides of Parliament, um, I was delighted at the number of young people on that. Uh, younger people were definitely in the majority on, on, on that. So it depends the kind of activity and what you're doing. It's not that, it's not that young people uh, aren't interested or aren't involved, it's just that um, attending this kind of public meeting uh, is, is not the current generation's method of, of, of doing politics. And I think there's no point being nostalgic for it. We, 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 we have to accept that's the way society has, has gone. Um, but to conclude, you know, I think you know, the gentleman who said uh, you know, we all face the question of you know, what we, would we have done in the 1930s, would we have stood out from the crowd, I think with freedom of speech it is coming uh, to that situation. Julian certainly you know, is jailed for nothing more than, than standing up against war crimes and for, for telling the truth. Um, I myself lost my job for blowing the whistle on torture and extraordinary rendition, and I didn't ever think when I joined the civil service that I would face the dilemma of what will I do if my government starts torturing people. Um, uh, but 
society, unfortunately, um, has slipped away on, on an increasingly uh, illiberal, dangerous, uh, and increasingly totalitarian, certainly authoritarian path in, in the last couple of decades. And there's no sign of it getting better. And uh, we have to uh, ring that alarm bell very strongly and persuade more and more people that they have to stand up in the way that Julian has done. I'd like to now invite John Jones to bring a message from the, both as a journalist, but also in his capacity from Norway. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, I, could, I have some good news for you and greetings from Norway. Um, a year ago, we gathered in a church like this. In a, a year ago, we met, gathered in a church like this with a jazz concert in combination with good voices like John Shipton and uh, Christian from WikiLeaks. And uh, after that, the smearing of Julian has stopped in Norway. Um, the leading, the leading um, broadcasters are actually speaking nicely of him, which is a, a shock to me, but it's, it's great. It's possible to turn the tide. I have uh, greetings from you. Uh, maybe I should say that that meeting, that church concert, was headed by the St. Julian Free Campaign, together with, with uh, Penn Norway, which is a rather good group. I have two greetings from you, to you from Norway. One from Professor Mats Andenes. You might know him as the former chief or chair of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. And Mats says, Dear Julian, it's directed to him, we will forever be grateful <coughs> for what you have done and still do and what you represent together with WikiLeaks. Your work touches on and upholds the very essence of what our civilization and society is, yes, our very lives <clears throat> rest upon. Justice and a legal system we can all have confidence in. Your contribution cannot be overestimated. Thank you. <clears throat> that was Mats. The second comes from um, a leading an icon, an icon of free speech in Norway a publisher called William Nygård, who was almost killed after he published the Satanic Verses in Norwegian. He survived the bullets, but he says, Dear Julian and friends gathered here this evening, justice will prevail. <clears throat> the British and the US authorities will have to let you out. We say justice will prevail. Thank you. Thank you, John. And before our final contribution, which is the award to Julian, uh, which Eileen is going to introduce and Jeremy is going to present, uh, and Craig is kindly going to accept on behalf of Julian as a friend, I want to introduce two other people in the room. We have our picket artist, Inga Bystrom, sitting at the front. She's been doing little sketches of those at the table and around there. She has an exhibition across the road for those of you supporting the RMT and the other, um, the nurses' pickets. So please do take the details from Inga and please visit the, the, the wonderful art that she has displayed. I'd also like to thank the people who make this event possible. F firstly, the stewards from the JADC, who came in early, set everything up, organized everything, and provided the wonderful cakes as well. <laughs> uh, thank you all for what you do and for standing outside Belmarsh in the cold, in the wet, standing in Piccadilly, standing in other places. And to those around the world in the various free Assange groups who are taking action to stand up for democracy, human rights, and press freedom. Thank you also to the the donors who provided us, me with the money to book this hall and to buy 
the copies of the books, that some of which you see at the door. So I, I'm very grateful to you. I'll now hand over to Eileen Chubb, who has, a, who has a wonderful history of whistleblowing as one of the original Bupa 7 care home whistleblowers, and who now, through her organization and the work of so many whistleblowers, brings together the best in society to allow us to know what happens behind closed doors to our friends in prison, to our friends in care homes. You know, when these are the whistleblowers who speak up in national security cases, these are the whistleblowers who speak up when there is a problem with, um, with those we care about, wherever it may be. So solidarity to all the whistleblowers, and I lean over to you. And if you would take my place, please. Can I just say amazing speakers and thank you to everyone who's organised this tonight. It's been really, really informative. Um, the Gavin McFadgen Award is aimed at improving free press, a really, truly independent media that stands up for truth and, and, and informs us what's going on. Um, and the idea of the award in memory of Gavin is to take a stand and try to say, this is the way journalists should report. This is the way it should be done and to try to make it the norm. Why is a free press so important? We recently called for evidence from whistleblowers and other witnesses who had at considerable risk to themselves reported abuse and other wrongdoing to the relevant authorities, such as regulators. We knew people were being failed by these authorities and we expected hundreds of witness statements. <clears throat> that deadline has been extended because the evidence continues to flood in and at the last count we had received over 23,000 accounts of people being failed by police, regulators, safeguarding. Where do you go when the established authorities are failing on this scale? Journalists are not the regulator of last resort. They are often the only hope of getting wrongdoing exposed. And such wrongdoing, um, one of our whistleblowers from probation, this week in the news, two people killed, uh, five people in fact were killed, and one young girl raped and murdered on, on a driveway walking home. Those offenders had been downgraded from high risk to medium risk. One of our whistleblowers in Liverpool lost her job for reporting exactly that risk. So every day we see the consequences. Behind every whistleblower, there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of lives at risk of serious harm, avoidable death and horrendous abuse. May there always be whistleblowers and journalists with the courage to publish the truth because we've never needed them more. We all know that journalists have to protect their sources, but the whistleblowers who vote in the Gavin McFadgen Award believe that duty of care runs both ways. The Gavin McFadgen Award is the only award in the world where whistleblowers vote for journalists who have made a real difference by exposing wrongdoing, corruption and human rights abuses. Whistleblowers are the toughest crowd, so to get their votes you have to be simply extraordinary. Before I go into the special category awards that we are here to present tonight, I'd just like to pay tribute to a young journalist whose work has won the Gavin McFadgen Award this year. Computer, Computer Weekly, a tiny little publication, and a young journalist called Carl Flinders, whose tireless work exposed the Horizon Post Office scandal, the biggest miscarriage of justice in the UK legal history. People would be still be jailed today if it were not for this young journalist. So there is hope, and every year we see excellence.
This year, whistleblowers also voted for one special category winner, the journalist whose work and case most exemplifies the importance of a free press. We're honoured to have Jeremy Corbyn here to present this award. Thank you. It's called the, the Tri Mic event. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to say, I've just come from. Uh, Adelante, the Latin American annual conference which we held at the at Hamilton House, the National Education Union place, and um, there were colleagues there from Ecuador who were genuinely very supportive of Julian Assange, and we uh, expressed our support for Julian at that conference, which was overwhelmingly well received by everybody there, and indeed his cause is supported by a number of very important leaders across Latin America, uh, particularly um, President Lopez Obrador in Mexico, Lula in Brazil, and others are all making the case to the US to stop the appeal and so that Julian Assange can be freed. And so our campaign goes on everywhere we can raise it. And I, I'm very proud to represent, uh, present this award, Gavin McFadden Award 2022 Special Category, the journalist whose work most exemplifies the importance of a free press. Julian Assange. Sadly, Julian cannot be here to receive it, but we had a wonderful event in Strasbourg this week where we had a a very long session of uh, speeches and music and uh, presentations about Julian Assange and the high point of the evening was when Julian came on the phone to the meeting. He didn't say anything, he was just on the phone and so he heard our applause and so as I present this to Craig, very grateful to you Craig for receiving it on his behalf, can we just have a thunderous round of applause so Julian can hear it, even in, uh, behind those stony walls of Belmarsh. Craig. Thank you. If I can uh, thank Jeremy very much on behalf of Julian, uh, there couldn't be a better winner than Julian, and there couldn't be a better person to present the award than, than, than Jeremy. And, yeah. and, uh, Jeremy's contribution to, to freedom and equality over many, many decades is something uh, which we're very, very proud to be associated with. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Thanks. Thank you. I, uh, it's also, um, uh, even though uh, only as a proxy, it's rather nice for me to have an award with, um, with Gavin on it. I remember after one uh, evening with Julian in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, Nadira and I uh, had stayed too late and probably drunk too much uh, to get home to Ramsgate where we lived at the time, and Gavin offered us to go and stay. Uh, with him at his home, his lovely wife. And uh, he took us there, and he disappeared up to bed, and he said, you can sleep on the couch in the study. We wandered into the study, 
where we could see no catch, but there was a huge pile of books and manuscripts, and we dug into it like an archaeological dig for some time, and eventually a couch appeared <laughs> underneath it all, uh, where, we, where, where, where we spent the night. So I, I have uh, fondest memories of Gavin. I, I'm, I'm delighted this prize uh, is named in memory of him. And thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. And we will end as we started with the wonderful choir. <laughs> choir, please do join us. And uh, thank you very much for being here. Just a reminder to those watching on the live stream, please stay online so you can see the art as it is walked through the room. Those who are here, please feel free to look at the art as you, um, as you walk around. Please look at the books at the back. And please don't forget to collect the memento in aid of the exhibition in the summer. Shall I get this to you? Uh, there we go. Sure, it's not for you. It's I will need all three. So maybe you don't want to start with it. So we're really pleased to have been part of this. Um, and thanks everybody who've spoken. Uh, it's been wonderful to be part of. Um, this song, which um, is uh, our second song, is called Legal, Illegal. It was written by Ewan McCall in 1977, sung by him and Peggy Seeger, and there have been cover versions by others. Uh, the song reflects on the fact that in the justice system of many countries, small crimes by ordinary people are illegal, whereas similar but much bigger crimes by the very wealthy, by corporations, or by governments are legal. Um, and I've just lost, my phone's just turned itself off, so, but I'll try and remember the last bit, which is we're going to sing a version with a new verse written by Roz um, to, to reflect uh, Julian's situation and um, the, the trial uh, that's described in Mills Meltzer's book. Um, we're really proud of Roz, who's one of our members, for writing this excellent verse, which is the last verse of this five-verse version. Thank you. Embedded with our boys up there, but to 
find out the truth about crimes of our side and share it to counter the government lies could lead to a show trial and decades inside. But whoever said truth was illegal to find out the truth about crimes of our side and share it to counter the government lies could lead to a show trial. And decades inside, there's no way the truth is illegal. Thank you very much to Raised Voices. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here tonight. Yes, okay, so hi everybody, come along and let's have a look at this exhibition. Right, so where is it starting from? From here, yeah? <laughs> right, so here we are with um, Selbury 2014. This is a statue of liberty. Should we move over now to the next one? We've got this beautiful picture as well with um, a heart and some swan, some swan wings. Yeah, this is actually a really nice picture, to be honest, in terms of um, how it's coming out of the man's body. I'm actually feeling this one. Next one. So we're going to be going around the church now to have a good look at what the pictures are saying. So let's go around. So here's another one from Sabri as well. And so this is um, Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay um, prisoners on their knees with the officers around them. This is a really hard hitting one, to be honest, in terms of um, yeah, how the drawing is set out. And this picture was actually done in 2012 and uh, this is of a prisoner's feet shackled with chains. And here we have a prisoner actually being tortured. So um, this is a very, very hard hitting one and shows exactly what took place um, during those times in the prison. And here we have a prisoner that's um, been shackled and got his head covered 
So for this this picture here um, brings truth um, for me really because we actually saw these pictures exposed in um, newspapers um, during the Iraq War. So yeah, this is a um, you know a perfect example of actually what took place out there. So as we move along around the rest of the church. Sorry. Right, come and join me over here. Right, this is a prisoner looking outside, trying to look outside with the small little window and that this one's hard hitting as well in terms of they're actually an elderly person holding a stick so this just goes to show what lengths these um you know the prison guards went to by arresting people who were elderly as well This is just some of the tactics that the US and the British obviously used against the prisoners as well. Here we have a dog barking at a prisoner whose face is covered up. So just imagine how these prisoners must have felt, you know, going through this and um, what impacts that it has on them even now. The exhibition is actually taking place in May. We haven't had a date confirmed yet as the event needs to be fundraised for and then we can officially find out the date that it's going to be taking place. But so far all we know is that it's going to be in the summer and it's going to be in May. But when the details do come out we will be sure to share the links around and obviously promote the event. So make sure you have a lookout for it and um, see you all in May.